Absolutely, and in the United States, of course, like with the development of the American Abstract Artist, which was established in 1936. Um, you know, it's also such an interesting group, kind of different from, say, what was happening in Buenos Aires, where you have artists who seem to really come together, have a shared, um, you know, mission in some ways, whereas the AAA is a group of all sorts of different people working in all sorts of different abstract styles. It's not just limited, it wasn't just limited to geometric abstraction, so it's also... Well, it was very practical. You certainly didn't have to stop <laughs> your comment for the microphone to make its way across the room. Um, not to be heretical, but but it occurs to me that um, you know if if Ligia Poppy's life is is somewhat circuitous in the way that she pursues her interests, or if Biederman's career starts and stops, uh, Ferrin's as well, or if uh, the Mahdi start and then move on to other things that it points out not so much about the artists or their creative progressions, but more the limitations of historical methods, and that these are just organic processes and the evolutions of lives. Um, and the good work that's being done here is breaking out of the ortho orthodoxies of how history examines events. And so I just want to you know, sort of underscore and applaud again the work that's being done, but say let's step back as well and realize where there's no kind of system, where there's no uh, geometric system, so to speak, to the results that we find. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it, one of the things, Monica, that uh, just came to mind when you were speaking um, was, you know, in, in this country, uh, really beginning in the 30s, there was uh, a lot of institutional support for certain artists, especially from the Museum of Modern Art. And, you know, it had such a strong hand in sort of establishing the, the canon um, from very early on, and I wonder in 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 South America, if there were institutions that uh, had a similar type of um, influence um, okay. in that regard, not like and, Paul, and, like and 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 like you know, if not, um, what what has that meant as far as the development uh, of a canon in Latin American art? Because um, I think that's a really important uh, issue. Um, I could certainly speak to the Argentine case is perhaps the, one of the most extreme in that. Um, there, there was none, and um, but literally none for a very long time, to the point that um, it's just a personal anecdote. But when I was doing my research on these artists in the early 90s, all of these works were still in the studio. In other words, they they hadn't gone anywhere, um, and they hadn't, and they'd barely been shown anywhere either. So, um, what that speaks about is a real um, a real gap in in interest. Um, he, he, there was very little reviewing, there's very little discussion of these works also. So you, you go from sort of zero to 100 very quickly, which has created a whole series of related issues about dating and, you know, construct these works have no provenance in many cases, and that, that's been an absolute headache in trying to figure this out. But I think that's a, that's a very extreme situation. Certainly in Brazil, it was very different. Um, th these movements were recognized as they were happening, and they had a much broader context and that a much broader institutional context. Um, Argentina's a case where it's only in, really in the last few years that there's been a, a, an understanding or an acknowledgement of these particular movements. It's a very interesting case. I think, too, this just has brought up something that I've been thinking about, which is another difference, I think, in terms of scholarship or canon building between North and South um, um, geometric abstractionists, because certainly I think the great exposure that's been given in recent years to Latin American geometric abstraction is becoming part of the canon at this point. A difference comes with what was happening in the U.S., at least in the 30s and the 40s, where, again, we're grappling with, you know, just trying to get the, even, you know, the stories out, get, you know, um, get their work out and, you know, finding where their works are and unearthed because they're generally not um, on view or they're still being deaccessioned or things like that. Um, so it's interesting. There's, there is this, I think, different, like the, the fields in terms of geography, you know, where it was made are at different points.
But, you know, but, but that's it. It's totally. I mean, it goes back to the issue of institutional, you know, development because here you, the Americans have to, you know. The, the geometric abstraction of the 30s and 40s, the work that was produced during that time, is overshadowed by abstract expressionism and minimalism. And so it, 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 it has been much harder for that group than, let's say, the geometric abstraction in South America to you know, come al alive in, in a way. And, and it goes back again to, to many ways to MoMA, because yeah. I mean, in the 1936 Cubism and Abstraction show, Alfred Barr said, no, you know, you will, you know, you're not included. We'll take your money, Gallatin and Shaw, but you know, we're not going to include your work in, in the show. The Whitney did that, which actually wasn't even true, that the it, Whitney yeah. had only sh hadn't shown well, the works of these artists. And if I'm not mistaken, and Susan, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think um, Morris and maybe Gallatin even sat on the exhibition committee yes, at MoMA. Did. Yes, they did. Um, and you know, when, if you read the catalog of the 1935 Whitney show, there's a quote from Stuart Davis saying that, you know, abstraction was really nice. It was a great phenomenon, mostly European, but now it's over. I mean, it was, and Davis was the catalog essayist and a great artist. So it's if, a conundrum, right? so if Stuart Davis is saying in 1935, that that was fun, you know, <laughs> and it's over. Um, it, you know, that was really something to say to young artists who were just starting. Yeah, so I think some of the issues that we're still dealing with today with these artists, you know, go back to its origin. I mean, go back, you know, from its reception, um, you know, back in the 30s when it was being made. So, you know. Brenda, building on that, like you talked about Albert's perceptions that his work might not be understood in Mexico. What were his thoughts about how his work was going to be received in the U.S. coming over? Um, he had great difficulty having his work accepted in the U.S. Um, and quite a bit of this, again, is in the correspondence with Kandinsky. It's really nice. But uh, he had some champions, but... Catherine Dreyer was one of the early um, people who included him in her exhibition for painters, which she circulated. But of course, that was again outside of institutions, you know. So I think that also as a as a foreigner, and he was sort of very German, and there was a bit of suspicion about that. So that was the other thing that, uh, in relation to talking about the sort of triangulation. Um, that politics was just played such a huge part. And I mean, Monica has shown us, you know, in the 50s how important it was. But I think in all these countries, the immigration from Europe, the uh, dictatorships in Latin America, the uh, Americas, what's it, the, you know, the engagement with Latin America policy in the 50s with Nelson Rockefeller and all of that was just very complex, but I think affected a lot the reception of of art. But Albus had a, I mean, he had a big problem with Barr, the Museum of Modern Art, who would never, you know, Barr saw him as a teacher. Barr thought he was a great teacher. He supported bringing him here to teach, but he didn't see him as an artist. And one of the reasons was that he really wasn't a painter. And again, Kandinsky says, you're sending me all these woodcuts, but, you know, dealers want paintings. They don't really want works on paper. So, that was how he really worked hard to become a painter. He realized that he needed to become a painter. 